my name's Kate Tolnai. Um, I work out of Southern California. Um, I work for the, a nonprofit um, for educators in the state of California, and we are the ISTE affiliate. So I, I uh, do some marketing communications, and I do teacher training. My kids call me a, a teacher of teachers. So that's what I do, um, though I have spent many years in the classroom um, and at the district level coaching teachers. And so my passion around this topic today really is going to be focused um, more on how to empower educators in their journey, um, in their game-based learning journey. And so I want to start with a common definition for game-based learning, um, which is the idea that learning occurs through gameplay. And so the as juxtaposed with gamification, I want to be clear that we all understand that GBL is um, using an actual game as the learning experience. And then by playing the game, the students reach the instructional objective. So um, we're going to take a quick poll. And I'm going to ask the audience if you can please answer, what type of games do you prefer to play? Do you prefer board games, more of an unplugged version? Uh, video game uh, or athletics, which is more organized sports. And um, I'll give you guys a, a few seconds to, to chime in and then we'll look at the results. So Thomas, do you have a preference when it comes to different types of games that you prefer to play? Sure, so I'd say my background is in video games, but um, increasingly, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's impossible to ignore uh, board games or tabletop games because there's there's so much overlap there and so much exciting stuff going on. So I've definitely been been reading more and playing more of those. Yeah, I, I've been impressed with just the this, this sheer um, variety. And as you can see here in in the poll, we see a lot we see a lot of engagement when it comes to board games at a at our level of whether it's generational level, um, you know, without having specific metrics on who our audience is. I just think it's really interesting to see such high numbers in the board games category. Okay, so so let's let's change perspectives and I'm gonna pose another question to you, which is what type of games do you think your students prefer to play? And Joey, I'd be interested to hear from from you at the um, that in higher education, do you have a sense of whether or not your students are more turned on by the board games, the video games, or athletics? Hmm, that's a good question. So my students, because they're in a master's program of game design development, I think they understand that both tabletop, you know, board games and video games are both very um, important and a lot of fun. So I think it'd be evenly mixed or evenly divided as far as um, what they prefer to play. Sure. Okay. Let's see what the audience said. So they, they whoa, oh my gosh. Are you guys, Thomas, Joey, are you surprised by these numbers? I'm very surprised. Whoa. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. Wow. And this is where the, the educator in me would love to like press pause and hear from everybody in this webinar, which isn't going to happen, but I would love to unpack this statistic right here because this is a really eye opening. So again, thinking about our, our experiences as um, the instructional leaders in the classroom, and, and there was a strong pull, we'll go back to those results one more time, strong pull for, for um, a preference around board games, and yet we see this, this uh, dichotomy with video games. And so I think you, oh, well, a couple more people voted there, so we're at 88%. Okay, needless to say, I think the numbers are speaking loud and clear. And this, these poll results actually align pretty well with this statistic, which is, um, it comes out of the 2018 Gamer Segmentation Report, that 67% of Americans ages two and older play video games on at least one type of device. So two or older. Now, I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, and I can vouch for their savviness when it comes to just clicking and learning. Um, so... I really believe that as educators, we have a unique challenge ahead of us. Uh, how do we bridge the tech use that's happening at home or in personal time that Joey, you did a fantastic job for presenting those numbers. How do we bridge that um, and, and empower our kiddos to use and learn the technology 
at school with with purpose and with larger larger meaning. And and one way to do that that I want to propose is through game based learning. So why does game based learning matter? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this um, real world example of gameplay. And this, you know, while we don't know exactly where this classroom is set, what time of day this is, we can kind of let's agree that this is a common scene from an academic space. But but let's unpack what's really going on in here. Um, one way to look at gameplay is to unpack it around the four C's. So again, making this is us talking about why gameplay matters, why game-based learning matters. And these four C's of game-based learning are critical to building the case of why game-based learning needs to happen. So we have, uh, and, and this, is, this is a framework proposed by um, myself and my co-author in our upcoming book released by ISG. Um, so I'll be talking about that later on. But the idea that game-based learning um, focuses on choosing. So learners experience choice in the process and in the product. Uh, game-based learning clarifies skills so learners can reflect on their progress in an iterative growth process. Um, game-based learning connects players. So learners build relationships through common progress, through skills, interests, and goals. And then finally, game-based learning creates opportunities to celebrate both process and mastery. So considering this image one more time, let's, let's deconstruct it a bit. So we have the power to choose. Uh, you know, this player here, we don't know, uh, we don't know exactly what is going on in his head, but our, the picture is suggesting maybe he's choosing whether or not to participate in the game. Uh, maybe he isn't confident enough to jump in there, but he's comfortable enough to engage from, from the outside. Maybe he's choosing which team he's going to be on next. Maybe he's waiting his turn and choosing which team he wants to support. Uh, maybe he's actually deciding how he wants to react to the gameplay. You know, uh, is, does he want to celebrate with one team or root on the underdog? So choice is happening from many different perspectives. We have clarification and, and here, um, you know, there's a real time progress happening right now, uh, or, or I'm sorry, uh, there's real time, there's a real time progress check happening right now. So the nice thing is that the players, as they're in, as they're, as they're participating in the game, they don't have to wait until the end to determine their progress. They're getting that feedback in real time. They're seeing the success. They're seeing whether or not they failed. They're, they're seeing mastery or they're identifying where they're struggling and they're self-correcting. And so that, that ability to clarify your progress or the progress of your team um, is powerful. Connectivity. Oh my gosh, those kiddos. They're, I, I like to, it, I like to create a story with this picture and I think they're winning. And so I feel like there's maybe some taunting or some cheering going on here, but the teamwork is there. There's shared experiences, there's empathy and interactivity. Um, and then finally, celebration, um, you know, encouragement, reinforcing progress and mastery. Um, so, so rich. So I think, if we uh, if we take the time to to prioritize these four C's of game based learning, it's it's hard to argue that there isn't a reason to bring more play and more GBL into our instructional practices. Um, here's the tricky part: uh, if we want instruction to change, and we really believe in the power of those four C's, um, we need to help teachers connect with this world of play and to start thinking like a gamer. And it's nice to know that there's a case for this that ISTE has proposed for us. I mean, there's, there's a ton of the ISTE standards that align to this, but you know, choosing and achieving, having our, having our learners choose and achieve and demonstrate competency, articulate and set personal goals, asking our educators to support student achievement, foster culture where, where students take ownership of their learning. I think this is all um, strengthening the case for game-based learning. So if we can agree at this point that game-based learning matters 
and as a priority, um, then we need to talk about how to make this happen. So often, um, we will default to um, game design that mimics what we're familiar with. But I firmly believe that if we deconstruct GBL, the design of GBL, then we can actually um, help our teachers design games for their learners, choose appropriate games for their learners to play, and even empower the learners to design their own games that hit distinct instructional and social emotional targets. And so here are the five steps of the GBL design framework, um, objective, design, challenge, assessment, and next step. So we're gonna actually take each of these one at a, one at a time in the context of one of my favorite games, which is Monopoly. And I uh, think it's every time uh, in, in my research and in my discussions around game-based learning, whenever I've brought up the game of Monopoly, I get a, a, a many different reactions, many of which are, oh my gosh, I have gone to an argument over Monopoly, or, um, you know, I lost a friend playing Monopoly, or, you know, just it becomes so highly emotional. Um, so let's deconstruct it a bit, thinking about the framework. So the objective, the objective of the game is really the in instructional focus, the standard, the hard skill that the player will master. And when it comes to Monopoly, the objective is simple, to make money, make money. And we have design. So, so actually I'll go back one slide because I went a little fast there. So when, we're, when it comes to designing the game or having our students design the game, having a distinct objective, measurable objective is key. And um, it, it's important when we're choosing games to bring into the classroom, like so many of the games that, that Joey and, and Thomas brought up, like when we're, when we're exposed to all these choices and we have to decide, it comes down to, well, is this game helping me achieve my instructional focus? So keeping that clear instructional eye um, from the beginning, and, you know, every good lesson has a good objective and every good game is gonna have a good objective as well. Uh, design. So this is this is the basic. Uh, these are basic setting the tools, the action steps that the players will take throughout the game. So is it is it played on a game board? Is it played digitally? Is it played with a headset? Um, is it do, do we need to click and navigate? Can is it uh, something we can manipulate with our hands? What are the rules? So the design itself. Um, thinking about whether or not it's developmentally appropriate for your learners. Um, emotionally appropriate for your learners. Um, sometimes it's deciding whether or not you want a single player game versus a multiplayer game and is your community and, and classroom culture ready for a multiplayer game. Um, making all of those strategic decisions from the beginning is, is key as well. And then we have the challenge, the challenge of the game. This is, this is so fun. This is designing an element of cooperation or competition within the game. Now, a lot of games may have many, uh, many elements of competition, but at the end of the day, there is, there, uh, when we're designing a game, we need to ensure that we are uh, designing with an appropriate challenge in mind. So for example, in Monopoly, this is a, this is a build challenge. So the players are constructing physical and virtual worlds, participating in economies like like trade and farming, uh, but some other challenges, maybe solving mysteries, um, hide and seek where players travel on journeys that include themes of escape and hunt, um, maybe collecting where players gather resources to hit a target or control where players battle to command other players um, or overpower the others, and, or maybe even survival, players engage in strategy puzzles. So again, identifying the, the challenge or the element of cooperation or competition that's going to be appropriate for your players. The fourth element is assessment. And this is where we're going to um, look at leveraging the processes and elements that measure mastery. Uh, so this um, really is about reading the other gamers strengths and weaknesses. There's a lot of psychological play happening in this assessment, but at the end of the day, how do you know whether or not you're um, mastering Monopoly? Well, how many hotels do you have? How many houses do you have? How much money do you have? So it can be as simple as that. Um, but again, in your game design, are you building in moments and tools and strategies for assessment? 
are your students playing the game and assessing themselves in real time. Um, and those are decisions that you can be making as you um, build your resources and come together with your overall GBL vision. Lastly, is there a next step? Have you established the extension of learning that motivates players to continue gameplay? I think it's essential for us to be thinking about our um, to be thinking about our learners who are going to excel um, because of prior experiences or because of natu natural tendencies. But I also think it's important for us to acknowledge that there can't that waiting for that next step to be the only point of mastery will actually could potentially be detrimental to players that might be struggling along the way. So whether or not those next steps, the next step comes at the end or the next step comes throughout the game design, it's important to just acknowledge the, the need to put a next step in there so that you can extend and build the case for further play. So going back to our four C's of GBL, oh, and I, I should say that the next step in Monopoly is to be the Monopoly. Yeah, I mean, I think this guy is pretty much showing the next step of Monopoly. So going back to the four C's of GBL, and again, thinking about the game of Monopoly, we have choice. We have the, the power to choose. You decide which properties you want to purchase, whether or not you want to purchase a property. You clarify your skills how much by showing how much money you have, how much property you own. You connect with other players positively or negatively, but you do build connections, um, whether it's by taking money or giving money. Uh, and then there's opportunities to celebrate as, you know, every time you go around the game board, you're getting 200 bucks. So, um, so keeping that in mind, I think um, what I what I hope each of you can can really just take away is that while we can use games and choose games to play, we can also design our own games and empower our learners to do so. Um, but it starts with being participants ourselves and thinking like a gamer. And I am just so grateful for this opportunity, this platform to share this passion project. Um, there's my contact information. Like I mentioned, our ISTE book is coming out in June. It's available for pre-order on Amazon and Burns and Noble. Um, and a shout out to my co-author, Lindsay Blass, who is a phenomenal partner in this journey. Thank you guys so much.